We'll be starting up in about two minutes. Two minute warning. We'll be starting up in two minutes. All right, folks. Welcome to the collaborate session for week six. Okay, so uh, here's the agenda for today. We're going to go really quickly through the slides uh, for the week six lecture, which was on the evaluation argument. Uh, we're that's your next one before next. Bef uh, that's your next uh, essay you're doing. Uh, to a question session, and then. Uh, since we're into week six, we're going to go ahead and do uh, three of the the uh, most recent discussion board topics. Uh, just so you guys, if you haven't had a chance to uh, do your topic already, it'll give you a chance to take a look at what it's about. All right. So first off, as far as business goes, uh, <clears throat> uh, just as a reminder, I did give you guys an extension on the uh, classical argument essay. Those essays are due this week. Uh, they should be due by Friday. Uh, I would hope that everybody's had a chance to have at least somebody look at it, uh, give them some feedback on uh, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, okay? Uh, some kind of feedback is good. I know I've had some issues with some people uh, emailing me and telling me that their teams have basically ghosted them uh, and nobody's been posting anything. Uh, we're going to address that in the coming weeks here because <clears throat> we actually, uh, in two weeks, there's going to be another one of these workshop sessions. Okay? So with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at this week's lecture. So. This week, we're covering uh, evaluative argument. Uh, what it is, at its simplest, evaluative argument is a review giving an opinion on the quality of the subject based on your own criteria. Now, that's going to be important for this is that you're going to have to come up with your criteria of what's going to determine for you what's quality and what isn't quality in terms of whatever it is you are evaluating, okay? Whatever the subject matter is, okay? Now, Evaluations have more in common with strong response essays than they do with traditional persuasion. In that typically they require minimal research. You only have to be at least familiar with what's being evaluated. You don't necessarily have to go into uh, immense intense research for it. Uh, you just have to know uh, what it is you're evaluating. You have to have some uh, experience with it. Persuasive nature of an evaluation makes it different from a typical movie or restaurant review that simply note the good points and bad points of the thing being evaluated. Now, here's the thing, though. A lot of more modern reviews uh, are starting to get that kind of argumentative and persuasive nature. Um, a lot more critics are basically going to bat and saying, give these people your money. Okay, they're trying to persuade you that this is something that's worth your time, that's worth your dollar. Okay, uh, 
So as a result, uh, when Yagelsky talks about traditional reviews being just, this is what's good, uh, there's good points and the bad points, uh, more recently, they've started doing overviews, okay, and uh, more persuasive appeals, okay? <clears throat> so the first of the myriad of exercises that are associated with this lecture uh, is this one regarding phones, okay? Uh, previously, the last textbook that we used for this class presented an example of comparing cell phones, which is quite dated. Okay, uh, what, we're do, what we do here is an updated version of it. So if you haven't done this already, here is the idea. So for this first exercise, you need to research some of the features on an iPhone and Android phone. So basically, if you have one or the other, research, do research on the one that you do not have. Okay, so for instance, uh, I don't want to pick it up because I'm using it for my hotspot, uh, but I have an iPhone 6S. OK, so I'm familiar with the iPhone. OK, uh, I can do research, actually in-person research on the Android phone because my wife has an LG Android phone. So if I use her phone, I can evaluate between the two which one I like better. OK, so uh, in this exercise, what you're basically doing is looking at two phones and giving your preference as to which phone you like better, okay? Uh, and why you like it better, what makes it uh, for you. And then you're going to rec choose which phone you recommend for these four individuals there at the bottom of the slide. Assuming for the purposes of this exercise that the Android phone uh, that you're offering to these people is the most recent Samsung Galaxy model, okay? Uh, I don't exactly remember the model name, but it's, but it's the Galaxy line. So, which phone would you recommend for a grandmother trying to keep in touch with her family, for a freshman starting college, for a single mother who needs to be in contact with her work constantly, or consistently rather, or a family of four looking for multiple phones to keep in touch at all times? Okay, so not only do you have to take into consideration the features of the phones, <clears throat> the reliability of the phones, the networks the phones are available on, you also have to keep in mind the cost of them as well uh, for some of these. Okay, so that's a basic idea. That's only the first of the exercises for this week. All right. So next slide, uh, we're looking at approaches to evaluations. The main approach that we're going to be taking for this is going to be what's called the criteria match process. Okay. Uh, what this basically means is you're going to compose a series of criteria as to what determines quality in your mind and line up the evaluation subject against those criteria and determine whether it meets those criteria or not. Okay. So in essence, what you're doing is coming up with a list of things that your subject has to meet in order for it to be considered a quality subject, okay, within the category that it belongs in. Criteria will be the primary arbiter of good or bad in this process, okay? So this is how you're going to evaluate the subject. Subject does not have to meet all criteria to be judged as good, though, okay? Uh, some some good things don't have to necessarily meet all of the criteria for perfect quality, okay? The met criteria then become the reasons behind your evaluative argument, okay? That leads us into the second exercise for this lecture, and that is uh, looking at the how it should have ended review of Wonder Woman, okay? So what you're doing for this particular exercise is looking through this review. It's a, vi it's a video, of course. Uh, what are the reviewer's criteria for his review? Can you pick out what the criteria are from the review that's presented to you? Okay. So that's the main thing I wanted to do with this one. Okay. We're looking at criteria. How do you determine uh, whether something is good or bad? Okay. So some issues you need to think about regarding criteria. One is the purpose and context. It's important to keep in mind the context of the subject being evaluated as well as the context and background of the evaluator. The writer's inherent biases and or background will influence the criteria used, okay? So you have to keep in mind that when you're looking at the How It Should Have Ended review, for example, uh, it's from the perspective of a superhero fan. 
implying that he is at the very least familiar with the comic book source material. So that's going to influence how he looks at the film and what kind of criteria he puts forth for a Wonder Woman film. And then whether or not this particular film meets those criteria or not. Okay. There are some special problems that you have to take a look at. One is different classes. Subjects should be compared only to other members of their class or category. Do not compare apples to oranges. Okay. If you cannot have a fair comparison between two items, then it's not a fair. Then it's not going to be good for use for an evaluation. Okay. Uh, if one thing is a uh, art movie and the other thing is a peanut butter sandwich, there's no way to compare those two. Okay. So what's going to make a movie uh, quality is not going to be the same as what makes the peanut butter sandwich quality. All right. That's what it comes down to is your criteria has to be something that can be applied to multiple uh, entries in that category. Uh, competing standards, perfection versus reality. Be upfront in regards to whether the criteria being used for evaluation is ideal or achievable. Okay. Uh, I would take this one step further and say that if it is something that there's no possible way uh, the subject can meet it uh, in your eyes, do not use this criteria. Okay, we are looking for good. We are not looking for perfect. Okay. Third, seductive empirical methods. Rationalizing everything into numbers. Good evaluations take the non-quantifiable into account in addition to anything that can be quantified. Okay. So don't try to force everything into the uh, realm of math and numbers. Okay. Because not everything is going to work in that realm. Uh, I gave an example in the video of the uh, uh, English professors who like to try to put, try to graph a poem's quality based on a, basically an arbitrary numerical scale. Okay, so don't try, don't fall into that trap. Another thing not to fall into: tyranny of cost. Some. Uh, assuming that something is automatically better because it's more expensive. That's not the case. It's Okay. Uh, matter of fact, I got a good deal thinking of this. You you pay a lot of money for uh, certain certain brands of cars. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're that much better. Okay. For example, uh, if you bought a Jaguar in the mid to mid to late two thousands, uh, you could have saved yourself about fifteen fifteen thousand dollars and bought yourself a Ford Taurus because it'd basically be the same car. Okay. Right down to the right down to the engine and the underpinnings. Uh, it was at the time the Jaguar was owned by Ford, and they basically tried to do uh, platform engineering across the board. Uh, so in order to save costs for Jaguar, they basically rebadged Ford Tauruses as Jaguars. Okay. So uh, just because something is more expensive does not necessarily mean it's better. All right. Uh, then we get into necessary, sufficient, and accidental criteria. Okay, so the sufficient criteria is baseline nominal criteria, the least you need to get by. Okay, however, that's not the same as necessary. Okay, necessary is what you feel is acceptable. Uh, if you don't think that the baseline is acceptable, if you can't live with the baseline, then what your criteria is going to be is necessary criteria. Uh, so, for instance, the job which gives you a lot of time for your family but pays nearly nothing can be described as necessary but not sufficient. Okay. Uh, a job that pays you a lot of money but requires you to stay stay at the office uh, 20, 20 hours a day for seven days a week is sufficient, but it's not necessary because now you're losing out on the time with your family. Okay. <clears throat> uh, accidental. Criteria are added bonuses, which are neither necessary or sufficient, but they're nice to have. These are not required, but are an added benefit. Okay, uh, they can help to contribute to the sense of quality. Okay, uh, if we go back to that example I had about the cars, uh, at that time period when people were comparing between the Taurus and the Jag, yeah, if if you wanted the Ford Taurus, you were buying a Ford Taurus because that was usually an affordable car. If you were wanting a Jaguar, uh, 
you were wanting the bells and whistles. You wanted like the full the full luxury package. You wanted the leather trim. You wanted the uh, sport suspension. You wanted sport wheels. Every all the little bells and whistles that uh, put the Jaguar above the Taurus. Uh, those are going to be your accidental criteria for buying that car. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, that gets us to developing evaluation arguments, okay? So the development of arguments for evaluation is very similar to that for classical arguments. Every claim needs to have a reasoning behind it and evidence to support that reasoning. In this case, uh, in evaluation arguments, there's also an underlying criterion, which is the basis for that claim and reasoning, and should also additionally be supported by other evidence and arguments. Okay, so as you're creating criteria, keep in mind that those are going to act as your reasons for your argument. And you're going to have to find within your uh, subject matter, you're going to have to find the uh, evidence to support those criteria. Okay, or whether it meets those criteria or not. All right. So the third exercise was to evaluate the argument from the critical drinker, uh, which was a contrary argument about Wonder Woman. Okay. Uh, what I want you to look for in that video is first uh, each claim and the reason for that claim. Okay. What what is for that for this basically I want you to say what is his overall evaluation. Okay. Then the evidence to support all of his cri uh, criteria of whether it meets or does not meet his criteria. Uh, the underlying assumptions or criteria based on what's presented. Okay. And then the evidence of arguments to support the assumption or criteria. Okay, so you're basically going to be analyzing his argument and finding all these elements. What are his criteria? Does does the movie meet those criteria? What's the evidence to show that it does or doesn't meet those criteria? Okay. Uh, and to save you some time, I cut out the beginning part of that video uh, in the lecture mainly because the beginning part of that video was a uh, retelling of the plot of the movie and it it was it went it goes a little let's be honest it was a lot blue okay with his language again this this reviewer there's a reason why he's called the critical drinker he's very drunk he's also very scottish scott uh i've noticed that scotsmen have no compulsions about cur about cursing okay so uh, so keep that keep that in mind uh, when you look when you see the lecture. That's the third of the four exercises. Okay. Now the fourth exercise is the EMP example. This is going to require you to uh, download the file from the uh, eCampus uh, class PowerPoints and YouTube features uh, tab. Okay. It's a sample evaluative essay. Uh, written by Jackie Wingard, evaluating a museum called the Experience Music Project, or EMP, in Seattle, Washington. Okay. So for the purposes of that particular assignment, uh, what I want questions I want you to answer for that section. Okay. How did Jackie Wingard compare the EMP facility to the criteria presented? Uh, what are the reasons why the EMP does or does not meet a criteria according to her? And then I want you to do some online research on the EMP uh, without any in-person experience with it. Would you agree with Wingard's evaluation and then tell why or why not, why you wouldn't, why you would or wouldn't agree with her evaluation, okay? That gets us to the actual assignment for the evaluative argument, okay? So the evaluative argument essay is going to be due on March 26th. Uh, two workshops weeks on this. The first is the week of March 12th, which is in two weeks, and the other is the week of March 22nd. Okay. Uh, sam sandwiched between those two workshop weeks is spring break. Okay. So we're gonna be we're gonna basically curve this around spring break. So you're gonna be writing evaluation of a particular subject. There are no requirements in terms of what you evaluate, but it has to be something you have good familiarity with. For instance, if you choose to evaluate a film, you should have watched the film at least twice to give a fair evaluation. As I mentioned in the lecture, uh, 
as far as picking your subject matter, uh, you're going to need to choose something that you have a lot of familiarity with. Uh, and it can be anything. It could be a story-based thing such as a film, a book, TV show, something like that. Or it could be an experience-based thing such as maybe travel elements like uh, hotels. Uh, it could be like uh, theme parks, regular parks, tourist attractions. Uh, it could be something that's used in everyday life like you could try to review a car or something. Okay? Uh, uh, channel your inner motor trend critic. Okay. Uh, pretty much, you can you can evaluate just about anything, so long as you have enough experience with it to give a fair evaluation. Now, as a part of this assignment, you should have a clear set of criteria for your evaluation. Now, when you turn it in, I'm going to ask you to include a list of those criteria along with your drafts. Okay. So when we when you turn it in, it's going to be uh, kind of like you're doing with the cl classical argument essays this time. Uh, except instead of a works cited page, in place of that, I want your list of criteria. Okay, so it should be final draft, criteria list, proofreading draft, revision draft. Okay. All right. So uh, that's part of the assignment. Here's the nuts and bolts of it on the next slide. Uh, the requirement for this: three to five pages, double space, eleven to twelve point font. Times New Roman Arial or Calibri fonts are the acceptable fonts. Uh, you need a works cited page uh, if you on, only if you do additional research. Uh, it's not going to be required. Your evaluation should only have a single research source, which is the evaluation subject. Okay. If you do further research, you'll need a works cited page. Okay. That's only if. In most cases, most students are able to do this without having to do any further research. Okay. Evaluation should be organized so that your criteria for evaluation can be determined from the context of your writing. I should not have to rely on that list that you give me uh, in order to understand uh, what it is that you're trying to compare against. Okay, the list is basically there to note so that I know that you actually have criteria. Then I need to then I'll look through the uh, paper and read through it and see if that comes through. Okay. So again, this is due on March 26th. Uh, first draft, you're going to be workshopping the week of March 12th, okay? So make sure you guys are working on this. Uh, next week, we're actually going to, in the lecture, you're going to have a chance to do some idea generation for this, okay? Uh, so just giving you a heads up there. All right, so I'll go ahead and open it up for questions here. Uh, if anybody has any questions about uh, this week's slides, or about turning in the classical argument, uh, raise your hands and uh, let me hear them. Evaluation is due on the 26th of March. The criteria list, is what, it, what the criteria list should include is basically everything you work, what, what qualities you need from your subject to consider it good, 
okay? Uh, so in general, what the categories are that you're looking at to, to evaluate it, okay? So for instance, if you were uh, just trying to come up with some general criteria for uh, say evaluating a, something story-based like a book or something, uh, you might wanna look at, let's say just for a book, uh, you want to look at plot, you want to look at writing style, you want to look at uh, characterization, you want to look at description, descriptiveness, okay? Uh, and determine within those uh, what's going to make it quality or not, okay? Uh, but for the criteria list, just, I just want to know in general what it is you are looking at, uh, not necessarily what's going to make it good, but what, what it, exactly you're looking at in order to determine whether it's good or not. No, the classical argument is a different, different beast here. It does not have criteria. Criteria is strictly for the evaluation essay.
Or we'll take about two more minutes uh, for questions here, uh, and then uh, we'll go on to uh, looking at the uh, discussion board. Last last three weeks worth. Cold staff hit me hit us pretty good. Uh, I, I, I think you missed the uh, uh, collaborate session last week uh, when I post, posted the announcement that I lost power. Uh, about 30 seconds after I posted that, the power came back on. So, uh, and it stayed on. So uh, we we actually came off pretty light about the post that we've had uh, happen to us. Uh, we had some plumbing issues, and right currently we have a toilet that doesn't work uh, in our house. But uh, other than that, we came out pretty light. So uh, turns out we're probably among the lucky ones. All right. All right, so uh, we're going to take a look at the uh, discussion board. All right, so uh, since it's been three weeks since the last time we did this, uh, we're going to look at weeks four through six uh, on the discussion topics. Okay, so uh, if you have if you have replied to these, thank you very much. Uh, if you haven't yet, this is what you're uh, this is what you're going to need to reply to uh, for for weeks four through six. Okay, so give you an idea of what we're dealing with. All right, so. Uh, week four, a tone deaf Super Bowl message. <clears throat> Yesterday was the Super Bowl, a Herculean accomplishment after an NFL season beset by delays and uncertainty while being played in a pandemic. One we'll of the more reassuring than normal elements of it, though, was the excitement and anticipation surrounding the commercials aired during the game, which was almost become a spectator sport in and of itself. There were some differences and changes this year, of course, after all of the chaos of last year. Budweiser, usually a major advertiser during the game, chose to only purchase one ad spot for a message celebrating frontline workers in the pandemic. Other advertisers focused on elements that may have changed about life because of the turmoil, examples being Bass Pro Shops, Bud Light's Lemon Storm ad, and Jeep's Bruce Springsteen ad looking for the middle. As a result of these elements, a single advertiser took the top two spots in the annual USA Today ad meter survey of viewers, as both ad spots from Rocket Mortgage took the crown. <laughs> What's sometimes interesting to note is the bottom of the list, where some of the most tone-deaf advertising tends to roam. Last year, for instance, the bottom two ads were political ads, with the very lowest scoring ad being from the Trump campaign. This year, while the bottom of the list was simply a confusing, weird ad, Oatly and Oatmeal producer had their CEO singing in the middle of a Swedish oat field. The ad had been banned from Sweden in 2014 after a lawsuit from the company's dairy industry. The second from the bottom ad was notable because it was the most tone deaf, as was for investment app Robinhood, the same app that received the PR hit after its actions in the wake of the GameStop short squeeze. The company purchased the ad in December prior to the controversy after a record-setting year in 2020. And a lot of people felt that keeping the ad space was probably a bad idea. It makes the company look even more out of touch with the clientele they had just betrayed. In a related note, Reddit, the host of the R Wall Street Bets board, ran five second regional ads, one of which took shots at Robinhood in its text. For your discussion this week, debate whether Robinhood should have run its ad during the game or sold the advertising space to a different advertiser. How does the situation help or hurt Robinhood's perception with the public? What possible good is there by having Robin Hood run the ad, and what difference would there have been had they pulled the ad? Based on the content of the ad, knowing what has happened with the small investors they deal with during the controversy of the last couple of weeks, how do you react to it as a viewer? Okay, so we have four sources for this uh, particular discussion topic. Uh, probably the best one of these is the USA Today source, that is the Ad Meter 2021 results. Uh, because that is an interactive list. If you click on the thumbnails of the ads, it will take you to YouTube where they will play you the ad, <clears throat> okay? 
The other three are mainly about the Robin Hood ad. One is from The Verge. Robin Hood celebrates amateur investors in awkwardly timed Super Bowl ad. Uh, one is from Mashable. Robin Hood's very bad Super Bowl ad gets some people real mad. And one from Deadline. Reddit ad runs five seconds but makes its point against Wall Street and Robin Hood. As a related addendum to this, uh, later on that week I noted that uh, the article about the Reddit ad mentions that uh, it was actually paid for by members of the R Wall Street Bets board. Okay, uh, they they paid for the uh, creation of the ad and they also paid for the airtime during the game. Okay, uh, po quite possibly from their profits from the GameStop short squeeze. <clears throat> All right, so that is week four. Let's take a week five. Week five, cancel culture or consequences, okay? This is a short one, but it's got a lot of baggage to it. So let's take a look. Social media and entertainment news sites lit up last week as word made the rounds of the firing of actress Gina Carano by Lucasfilm. Carano, who had played the role of fighter Cara Dune in Disney Plus's hugely popular Star Wars spinoff series, The Mandalorian, was fired in the wake of numerous social media posts which had been judged by the company as abhorrent in nature. Carano, an ex-MMA fighter who has appeared in films and television shows in the past six years, including popular titles like The Mandalorian and Deadpool, later in the week announced a partnership including a movie deal with conservative site The Daily Wire and commentator Ben Shapiro. Almost immediately after the firing was announced, social media became split into two camps surrounding the actress. A number of people fell on the side of Lucasfilm, as the posts they had fired Carano over were offensive ones, which included, among other things, COVID virus misinformation, including vaccine skepticism, election misinformation, homophobic and anti-trans content, and comparisons of conservatives to Jews being persecuted by Nazis in the 1930s, the latter of which directly led to her firing. Conservative figures, including politicians like Senator Ted Cruz, leaked to Carano's defense and called the firing the latest example of internet cancel culture, basically claiming the firing had nothing to do with her social media postings being patently offensive and everything to do with her being conservative in a traditionally liberal industry entertainment. For your discussion this week, argue for or against the firing of Gina Carano and the reasoning for the firing. Is the consequence too harsh for the offense that Carano is accused of or is Lucasfilm within their rights to fire her? If you were working on the show, would you have fired her, and why or why not? As a bonus discussion, argue for a replacement for Carano in the role of Cara Dune. There are six sources attached to this particular topic. Okay? Uh, first, from US Weekly. Gina Carano fired from The Mandalorian after sharing controversial social media posts. Then Hollywood Reporter, Ted Cruz among conservatives blasting Disney over Gina Carano firing. The Mary Sue, the Mandalorian's Gina Carano getting fired as consequences, not cancel culture. The National Review, it's a blacklist, plain and simple. Uh, we have Vanity Fair, Gina Carano strikes back after Star Wars implosion. And the last one's from Complex, fired Mandalorian actress Gina Carano announces movie with Ben Shapiro's Daily Wire. Okay. Uh, I will say that if... Uh, there's only one most of these are factual in nature there's only two that are really opinionated okay uh, one is the Mary Sue that's a commentary and the National Review one is also a commentary and those are on opposite sides of the divide here so if you need uh, some backup for your side of things although generally speaking when I've been reading the threads uh, the replies to threads almost everybody thinks that uh, uh, Disney did the right thing in firing Carano uh, but if you need some justification for your answer, for your response, and you need a uh, commentary to back that up, uh, those two are going to be the uh, best sources for that commentary. Then we have the third one. Uh, this is week six, okay? Uh, blowback from the blizzard of the century. All right, so uh, here is this week's discussion topic. Excuse me. Doubtless, everyone was affected in one way or another by the bitter cold that swept across the U.S. last week, leading to record-breaking low temperatures, dropping to negatives in some areas of Texas, and heavy snowfall. Some were affected more than others as the state continues to pick up the pieces after the storm's aftermath, attempting to return to pre-storm normalcy. Among the fallout, though, are new questions about the utility companies operating within the state and their failure last week. 
Unlike other states, most of the state of Texas falls under an independent state agency, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, or ERCOT, which coordinates competition between power companies and acts as the state's regulatory board for electric utilities, as opposed to other states falling under the purview of the Federal Department of Energy. The Texas system was intentionally designed to force federal regulation out of the state. This wound up backfiring spectacularly during this winter weather emergency, the worst state seen in a decade. In the 10 years since the previous winter storm, ERCOT did minimal, if any, improvements to help facilities weatherize to withstand winter temperatures. While other states are well prepared for these sorts of temperatures, Texas's infrastructure was not, leading to widespread failures of equipment and ultimately to rolling blackouts statewide to conserve power usage as demand shot to the roof for consumers needing to heat homes. While politicians were quick to blame green energy infrastructure for failures, the fact that was that the lion's share of the state's electricity generation comes from thermal and fossil fuels, while only approximately 10 to 25 percent of the load is generated by green sources, primarily wind. A greater culprit seems to be overconfidence in the grid's ability to withstand the weather and lack of oversight by ERCOT. This, the issues are now coming quickly to ERCOT as amid reports of consumers receiving obscenely expensive power bills, for example, in Arlington homeowners nearly $16,000. Two lawsuits have been filed in connection to the power issues, including one from a family in Conroe, whose son apparently died of hypothermia while trying to keep his three-year-old sibling warm in a depowered mobile home. For your discussion this week, talk over the situation with the electric companies and ERCOT. Should Texas dissolve ERCOT and return to federal regulation, or should this reform the board to fix the issues created by the situation? Notable is that the extremities of the state, such as El Paso, can still connect to other states' grids to compensate while the central part of the state is completely isolated. Should this remain the case, or should action be taken to connect the rest of Texas to the national grid? We have five sources on this particular topic. Uh, first one is from a site called Enveris. ERCOT power grid outage, what went wrong? And we have Texas Monthly, Q&A with ERCOT president and CEO Bill Magnus. We have the Houston Public Media, dust off my bill. Turner tells lawmakers to reconsider ERCOT legislation he filed in 2011. And we have Texas Tribune, Governor Greg Abbott, other top Texas officials call for resignations and investigations as a grid operator. And then finally from USA Today, let your boy die after his mobile home lost power. His family is suing Texas utility companies for $100 million. <clears throat> So this one's pretty, uh, pretty close to home. It's pretty recent. Uh, should be kind of fresh in your mind. So if anything, this one, if you haven't done any yet, this one is probably going to want, you'll probably want the, this one to be the first one you do because it's right there in your mind right now. We just got through dealing with this stuff last week. So you might still be dealing with it. Uh, I don't, I don't know how everyone's power situation is, but uh it's fresh in your mind. So if you want, uh, if you haven't done any of the other topics yet, I would recommend this one be the first one since it'll be the easiest to do. All right. So uh, that takes care of those. Uh, so I'll go ahead, uh, one more round of questions here. We'll go to about 150 uh, and then we'll call it a day here. Uh, so if anybody has any further questions, if anybody has any questions that they just thought of about classical argument uh, or about this week's lecture or about the discussion board, now it's time to ask. Go ahead and raise your hand so I can uh, get you guys uh, so I can get you guys called on.
right, folks, that's going to be, that's going to do it for this week. Uh, so uh, next, next week, we're going to be talking about the uh, uh, evaluations. We're going to be, we're going to be looking at doing some idea generation for evaluations and also uh, looking at some examples of evaluation. Okay. So uh, with that in mind, uh, so go ahead and start thinking about what you want to use as your subject. Uh, and uh, of course, keep going with the discussion boards and the lecture exercises uh, and the mind tap materials. Okay. Uh, and we'll have another week's sessions next week. Lecture will come up live on Monday. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for, thanks for coming by.